Well, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and, and for the invitation to speak. So I'm going to be talking well about the Abelian sand pile. Um, so I think some of you have seen different parts of my of this talk before. So this is this is joint work with Lionel Levine and Wesley Pegging. Uh, so Lionel is also faculty in math, and and he gave a talk I think in this colloquium probably might have been two years ago I think I heard on well. You know, presumably his work on the sand pile, which is going to include some of what I'm going to talk about today. So this is a project that we've been working on now for, gosh, I think it's been four years. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about, you know, sort of bits and pieces of everything we've worked on in these four years. So some of the stuff will be presumably what Lionel already talked about, and some of the stuff uh, will be more recent. Okay, so you know, any talk about the sand pile, um, well, she sort of has to start in the beginning, so I need to tell you what the sand pile is. Okay, so the Abelian sand pile, so this is a, a model uh, that comes from statistical physics, so it's a model of self-organized criticality. Okay, so don't ask me what that means. You should ask Lionel uh, what that means. Um, he's much, he uh, uh, understands uh, uh, the statistical physics literature much better. Um, you know, my understanding of this is that it's somehow just a failed physical model, um, that it's, you know, has turned into interesting math. Okay? So it's a deterministic diffusion process on graphs. Okay? The way it works is, well, we, uh, you have some a configuration of particles sitting on the vertices of your graph. Okay? And this configuration evolves under a very simple rule. So you know, say at each step, uh, any vertex that has at least as many particles as it has neighbors uh, sends one particle to each of its neighbors. Right? So, so if we're here, right? If, we start, say, with this graph, with that uh, configuration of chips, well, there's exactly one site, right, that has as many particles as neighbors, so it topples, right, sending one chip to each of its neighbors, right? And then after that step, right, uh, now there's exactly one vertex with as many particles as neighbors, so it topples, and now there are two sites with at least as many particles as neighbors, and they topple, and now suddenly we're back in the original configuration. Right, so on this graph with this configuration, there's just some loop, right, that uh, uh, that keeps going. Right, so there's there's just some uh, uh, some periodic uh, 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 sequence of configurations. Okay, so this model turns out is not just a statistical physics model. So it's it's been sort of reinvented several times um, in kind of interesting contexts. Uh, so you know, I don't want to discuss that too much. So if you're interested, you should, uh, sh you should read this survey article. Uh, uh, I think it's, you know, what is a sand pile in the AMS Monthly. So this, I think, was written by Lionel and, and Jim Prop, And they talk about how, you know, this is sort of accidentally invented in a bunch of different uh, contexts. So in fact, I think the first instance comes uh, before Bactang and Weisenfeld. It was invented by a high school uh, uh, teacher to explain probability theory to, uh, to his students. Okay, so what are we going to look at? Well, so we're going to look at, uh, so rather than on a finite graph, like I just uh, like we just saw, we're going to look at the sand pile on infinite periodic graphs, so say on the square lattice. Okay. So on infinite connected graphs, uh, the sand pile has its nice feature, which is that if you start with a configuration that's finite, because there are finitely many total chips, then that configuration always eventually stabilizes. Okay, so for example, right, if we if we start with 24 chips, say at a single site, okay, well that's going to topple six times, right? And after it's toppled six times, well, uh, then there are say six chips at each of the uh, uh, the four neighbors, and now each of those are going to topple once, okay? You get some configuration like this, right? And then. Uh, uh, so this is a particular sense for chips back to the origin, so that uh, topples again, and, and, and you end up with this final stable configuration. Uh, right. why, why did the one, uh, <coughs> it's an infinite graph, isn't it? What? So that one can, be, can perfectly well spread out to its neighbors. So what, what's one? your infinite connected graph? Uh, this is just a, a little, this is, I'm imagining I'm in the square lattice. But I've only drawn a you know five by five little piece of it. So why didn't that one topple over to the zero next the door? Because the one's too small. So you only topple if you have four. Yeah. Oh, four. Oh, yes, yeah, okay. so you need you four to, to topple. You have to be rich enough to give each of your neighbors. Right. 
Yeah, so should we go back to the... So okay, we is, came in late. Yeah, yeah, so this is the rule, right? So you have a configuration of particles that evolves under uh, this toppling rule. So if you have a vertex with at least as many particles as neighbors, Oh, as then, neighbors, yeah. not as its neighbors, okay. Yeah. Ah. Okay. So what we're going to do is, well, we're going to look at what happens when you stabilize some huge configuration, a uh, huge initial number of chips at a single site. Okay, so to do this, of course, I don't want to be drawing lots of tiny numbers, so instead we're going to use colors. So I'm going to have this color scheme where, okay, three is red, and two is yellow, and one is uh, cyan, and zero is blue, okay, and white, white is also blue, uh, sorry, white is also zero, okay, uh, but, uh, uh, but so blue is a special kind of zero, blue is zero, but at some point during toppling you saw a chip. Okay, now we're just going to look at what happens when we increase the number of chips. So this is what happened when we started with 24 chips. Okay, and this is what happens if you start with uh, uh, 256 chips. Okay, and uh, 2 to the 12th, 2 to the 16th, 2 to the 20th, and 2 to the 24th, and 2 to the 28th. I assume we're seeing a great big piece of the plane. Yes, that's right. So it's a great big piece of the plane. It's about you know, square is proportional to, you know, the diameter is proportional to the square root of this. And what you're showing is always the stabilized. And what I'm showing is always the stabilized configuration. Yeah, uh -huh. right. And your computer is unable to uh, reproduce the natural symmetry. Well, this is the screen. It's like stretching the picture for some reason. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's like it's turning a square signal into a fake HD signal. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, this is supposed to be square. So maybe if you just if you took a different seat, you know, maybe you could look. No, no, no. no. <laughs> See, because if I'm here, then it looks fine. We're used to technology right, so. torture. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So let's just remember. So this, right. So this. Right. This is stretched. But okay. So what's happening? So so somehow you know we start with this with this simple rule, right? And you know, this is some, this is essentially just a cellular at automata, right? And we plug in some huge number of chips and we get this, this curious output, which is a, an approximation of some fractal image. Okay, so, so then the natural question is, well, you know, so why, why does this fractal appear? So we'd like to know why does this uh, uh, thing show up and how, you know, how does, you know, why, what is it about the dynamics, right, that's producing this, this fractal image. So this is a question that I hope to hope to answer. So I, you know, we we don't completely understand this picture. Okay, um, as mathematicians, we definitely don't completely understand this picture. But you know, as as a, as a, I think we somehow we completely understand this uh, uh, on the level of, of, of physics. Right. So in a sort of hand wavy way, I can completely explain what's happening in this picture. Um, and then what's well, we'll get to what I can prove precisely later. And is your team responsible for discovering this picture, or was that already no. known? No, so this picture, as far as I know, this was discovered almost as soon as there were computers fast enough to compute it. Uh -huh. So, you know, this model was invented in 1987, and I think probably you could have done this on uh, the second generation of Apple computers, but not on the first. Uh -huh. But but people did do it or did yeah they, they did they really they did, did. They okay because I don't remember anyone starting with a big tower of chips okay so I I thought that this picture has been known for a long time uh, maybe I just yeah. ask I but it's not a typical thing a physicist would do to start with a huge number of chips yeah and see they what were happens. just raining them down at random no that's or, true yeah, yeah you know you're right. You're right. they were asking very different questions right <coughs> okay so right so I thought I thought this picture is, is fairly old certainly I didn't invent it so okay. you know, I. I saw this at a conference and, uh -huh. and, and got excited about it because, uh, you know, I thought that, that, well, we'll see. I thought uh -huh. that I'd be able to say fine about it. Okay, so, so before we move on, so, so fine. So there's this limiting fractal image, or at least it appears there's this limiting fractal image. Okay, but there's actually a more to this story than just the high-level picture. Okay, so the other thing, uh, there's another thing that's going on. So you see there are all these little triangles in here, these sort of curvilinear triangles. And if you zoom in on these triangles, okay, what you see is there are all these uh, 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 periodic patterns that appear in these triangles. So you know, here there's a constant, like a solid red region, and here there's just these dots, and here there's another pattern. And here, let me zoom in again so you can see this middle one. 
Right, so somehow each of these little curvilinear triangular pieces are made out of you know, periodic patterns. So in addition to explaining the fractal, well, we also need to explain what these patterns are. Okay, so the first big step uh, towards understanding what's going on um, is this thing called the, uh, the least action principle. Okay, so this is essentially falls out of the proof that the process is abelian. So I didn't really say mention anything about this. Um, so the dynamics, right, kind of leave unspecified uh, uh, the order in which things are supposed to happen, right? So I say, you know, like, you imagine the rule is well, any time a vertex has at least as many particles as uh, neighbors, then it topples. Okay, now you didn't really tell you, you know, in what order you should do this in if there are multiple vertices that can topple at once, but it turns out that this doesn't matter. Okay, the process is confluent. So as long as you're passing all the way to stabilization, it doesn't matter what order you do these things in. Okay, uh, so in, in this sense, the process is abelian. Okay, and this, this is, the reason the process is abelian is because, well, really there's some variational principle. Okay, that, uh, well, the way stabilization occurs is, well, you, you, just, you always do the least number of topples that you need to do to stabilize uh, a given configuration. And so what this means is, well, there's a natural translation of the Sampile process into sort of a, a, a finite difference scheme, okay? So, so instead of stabilizing a configuration, I can instead do the following. So I can you know, pick a big square, say an n by n square in the lattice, okay? And I can look at the point-wise least integer valued function, which is greater than or equal to zero outside of the square, okay? and has graph Laplacian less than or equal to three inside of the square. So this, you know, this is just some finite difference scheme. You can just compute this on, on the computer, this, this minimum function. Okay, and the key is now, so why, why would a pointwise least function exist? Well, because the graph Laplacian has this nice monotonicity property whereby if you have two functions that have graph Laplacian less than or equal to three and you compute their pointwise minimum, then the pointwise minimum also has graph Laplacian less than or equal to three. Right, so in particular, you can just take all of the functions that satisfy this, and you can just min them all together, and you're gonna get a function which satisfies this. So you can just compute this. Okay, and it turns out that if you compute this function, and then you look at its Laplacian, well, the Laplacian is a sampile. Right, it's, it's, it's one of these fractal it's a similar sort of fractal image, of course, this time supported in the square. And if you were to do this on a line? You mean in one dimension? Yeah. So in one dimension, it's very boring, right? Because you, in one dimension, this would just be one, and then you would just, uh, you could just write down, it's just a polynomial. So in fact, in one dimension, you would just get, uh, so the point is in 1D, this function, Right, this guy is integer valued and has graph Laplacian identically one. Right, so the answer is very boring, and then the picture you're going to get is just solid ones. Okay, so this is sort of the first step, translating this thing into a finite difference scheme. Okay, so I realize I, I didn't really explain exactly how one does this, but you, so let's just take it, just have to take him faith here that that, okay, this really is the same thing. Okay, there's, uh, you, you, know, you can read these papers and you can write down this problem and you'll see, okay, these things are equivalent. Okay, so now, so what's the next step? Well, so now that we've translated into this language so that we have a nice finite difference scheme, so this somehow is essentially where things were when I first learned about the problem. And when I saw this, so as a PE person, you know, I got very excited because of course, the people who were working with this problem, well, they didn't know anything about PDEs, and they didn't realize that, well, if, once you find the Laplacian, you're done, right? That somehow, if you, find, if you found the Laplacian, then that's everything, right? This is what uh, uh, Caffarelli taught us. Okay, so it's all just about finding the Laplacian, and once, once you have the Laplacian, then, then you can figure everything else out. So they, they sort of got here, and they didn't know where to go from there, okay? And, Okay, but I, uh, 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 I, I had some idea of where to go next. So I started working with Lionel and Wes on this. Um, so the basic first step is, well, when you solve this problem, okay, you, you're gonna get some function whose Laplacian, well, it's less than or equal to three, 
but actually it's going to end up being bounded. It's going to be greater than or equal to zero. So you're going to have some function whose graph Laplacian is bounded. And we know that these things are regular. They're fairly regular. So we get sort of for free from existing machinery some compactness. Okay, so in particular, we know that if we rescale quadratically, right, so if we somehow if we scale these functions back to the unit cube, well, then they're uniformly bounded and equicontinuous. Okay. So we know these Vn's, well, if we rescale them, they're uniformly bounded and equicontinuous. Okay, so we have some compactness. We know at least along subsequences they converge to continuous functions. So if we want to show that there's a limit, right, that, you know, that, that, that there really is a limiting image appearing, well, it's enough just to characterize the limit, right? So we just have to characterize the limit, say, as the solution of a PDE with, uh, with a comparison principle. Okay, okay. <coughs> so, so what then? Well, so we found the Laplacian, and you know, because essentially what we're doing in this problem is we're computing the, you know, the least super solution, okay? Okay, that means that you know, we should be using some viscosity solution theory to uh, figure out what's going on. And so somehow, you know, doing, you say work, so I'm trying to explain this without, without actually saying anything really about PDEs. Um, so, you know, there's some abstract machinery that tells you that, that this is the thing you need to look at. Okay. So the thing you need to look at, okay, is, uh, uh, is uh, you need to ask yourself, so which uh, quadratic polynomials on R2, okay, specify rates of growth that can be achieved by integer valued functions whose graph Laplacian are less than or equal to three everywhere. Right, so I want to call a quadratic polynomial on R2, so a quadratic polynomial function on R2, I want to call it integer superharmonic. Okay, if and only if there's some integer value function on the lattice, which, well, grows like that quadratic polynomial at infinity, okay, and has graph Laplacian uh, less than or equal to three everywhere. Whereas right, so the idea somehow is, well, we're going to look at these v's, and right, so these v's, uh, uh, they satisfy this inequality, right, in the square. Okay, but imagine if we blow up to infinity, right, then there's some, somehow they're going to be uh, satisfying this inequality on all of space. Okay. And if we assume, say, that we blow up along the correct sequence so that they're blowing up to something that has roughly quadratic growth, right, then we're going to have found one of these integer superharmonic guys. Okay, so fine. So, so, so this, is, you know, kind of this, this is the correct definition uh, uh, to look at. And in, indeed, so you can prove a theorem. change that 3 to a 5? What? Change, if I were to change that 3 to a 5, would it change the theory? Uh, so it turns out for the square lattice, no. And the reason is because of this guy. So if I look at this guy, right, this has, uh, you know, if I extend this into 2D just by padding, right, then this is going to have graph, graph Laplacian identically 1. <clears throat> okay? So I can always add this to both sides and add this polynomial to both sides. <clears throat> so somehow, if I change this to a 5, okay, it's technically going to shift this this, this set of Q's, but the way it's going to shift it is just by adding this polynomial. So where's the change it to a 2? Change this. No, because uh, uh, because you can subtract instead of add. Why on earth are you using 3? <coughs> uh, why on earth am I using 3? Well, because this is what comes from the Sandpile models. The idea is you topple if there are 4. So somehow this, uh, this comes out of the Sandpile. So if you use a different form of the same question, where the place is on the triangular line. Right. What would be the result? You obviously would have to change the numbers there. That's right. That's right. I, I mean, you can, you can write down the same definition on the triangular lattice. Um, but I mean, have I even told you what the result is on the square lattice? <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to tell you the answer to both of those questions. Yeah, and also the hexagonal lattice, and also a few other ones. Uh -huh. Okay, so, right, so I'm trying to sort of rush through this part, but the basic idea is, so there's some abstract machinery, and it tells you that the question you need to ask if you want to understand this fractal is this one. You need to ask yourself, we well, you need to make this definition, and you need to ask yourself, what, do these, what are these, uh, uh, what is this set of polynomials? What does this set look like? Okay, so now I think I have a slide that says, yes, this is what you need. Right, okay, so the point is, with this definition, you can capture the limit. 
Okay, but somehow what this uh, what the limit is is um, so in the limit the thing you're getting is is the pointwise least function. Okay, that has the property that well, okay, it's greater than or equal to zero outside the unit square, and inside the unit square, well, any place the function is twice differentiable, the second order Taylor expansion is integer superharmonic. Okay. Which okay, you need to write in this viscosity solution way in order to make precise. Sorry, I, I'm going to embarrass myself. I'm not. I don't really know what you mean by pointwise least. Um. I just want. I just mean that it's the minimum of all of the all these things, like it's the inf of all functions, the pointwise inf. So, right. So I'm I'm saying that the limit guy is the. So this is just the inf of all uh, say w. So that is where w satisfies one and uh, one and two. But so, what's going on with x? Am I fixing x? I'm yeah, so for each x, for each x, this is true. Okay. You have to use that board again, use a different writing. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I meant to actually, <laughs> yeah. Can anyone read this? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I could get uh, you one from another room. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, it looks like someone else is going to get one. Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> I see. So you imagine this ensemble of functions that satisfy one and two. And right. You just take their least value. You just take their least value everywhere. Fine. And in fact, there is, a, there is actually a minimum one. Okay. So these two conditions are such that, um, well, you know, that the, that the minimum of all, the, the inf of all of them is also going to satisfy. Is okay. Is are not actually greater or equal to zero everywhere? Is it really awesome? No, because of this. Uh, yeah, because you're allowing, you're relaxing this to, whoa, there's some lag here, right? So, because this is a three, right? So it allows it to bend upwards a little bit. Like if there's so a where is it negative? Uh, it's negative everywhere inside the square. So it's kind of, a, the actual shape of it is like, it's kind of bowl shaped, right? So it's, uh, there's, you know, you have the boundary of the square, outside it's zero, and inside, it's kind of sh shaped like this. So it's not the number of elements in your sand piles. No, it's in fact, it's counting. Three. Right. So what's happening is it's, it's it's somehow counting the number of topples. So the way this is the same as the sand pile is this is if like you so you have this n by n square, okay, and you take sand and you sort of dump it on from the outside. Okay. Or if you want, you just pile it up around the boundary. And you, and, and so you pile it all up along the boundary. You pile a lot of sand around the boundary. And then you just let it topple. And things which fall <laughs> off the edge, you just let them fall off the edge. Okay. And it turns out that as long as you start with a sufficient amount of sand on the boundary, just the, there's just the correct total number of chips, then the resulting stabilization always looks the same. It's always this picture. And the total number of topples that happen um, uh, uh, is given by uh, uh, this function. And how can a number of topples be negative? Um, <coughs> so the idea is here, so we st the idea is so you start with no chips, right? And then we're going to be uh, uh, pulling chips in from the boundary. And the way we're going to be pulling chips in from the boundary is by untoppling. Right, those guys in the middle never toppled. They right. only acquired they, sand. They, they, so that's like they, yeah, they acquired topple. sand. So they toppled a negative number of times. I mean, so this is, like, we're beginning to have the discussion <laughs> where, uh, uh, where, I, where we're going to have to explain what's in these papers. And I wanted to, okay. for the purposes of getting to the stuff that we're doing more recently, I wanted to just assert the sand pile is equivalent. This is also the sand pile for reasons that I'm not going to explain. Yeah, OK. okay. Um, well, I guess I explained it a little bit. <laughs> Okay. So this is the sample. So this is the first step towards understanding that picture. Step two is realizing that you need to make this definition. Okay, you need to look at these allowable quadratic growths at infinity. Okay, 
So step three is that, well, this is enough somehow. The PDE machinery tells you that if you can understand this set, then you've captured the limit. Okay, so what do we want to do next? Well, so there's this abstract machine that says, okay, uh, you know, since you made a nice definition and the machinery applies, there actually is a limit. So the sort of the first theorem that we proved is that, well, actually this image does stabilize as, as n goes to infinity. So this had been you know, open for 20 years, and you know, we turn, it turns out that this is fairly straightforward if you understand this viscosity solution theory. Okay, so the next thing that we wanted to do is, well, we really wanted to explain the fractal. We don't just want to know that there is a limiting image. We want to understand the limiting image. Okay, so to do that, well, we need to understand better this set of quadratic polynomials. So let's remember, you know, say so your integer is super harmonic if and only if there's an integer valued function that grows like u at infinity and right, has discrete Laplacian less than or equal to 3 everywhere. Okay, so first of all, um, this, because of this little o of x squared term, the, uh, the linear part of your quadratic polynomial is irrelevant. Right? It doesn't have any effect on whether or not it's integer super harmonic. Okay? So that means that really we're just looking at symmetric two by two matrices. So a, a homogeneous quadratic polynomial on R2, or polynomial function on R2, right, this is just, it always has this form, right? For some two by two real symmetric matrix. Okay, so we're interested in understanding the set of all of these guys. Okay, so I want to define this set gamma to be, well, it's the set of Hessians, right? It's the set of matrices that give integer superharmonic polynomials. Okay, so this is some subset of the two by two real symmetric matrices, right? And this is really, this is basically the same as R3, right? So the two by two real symmetric matrices, this just has real dimension three. Okay, so what does this set look like? So it turns out that, well, you can numerically approximate this set. So there's an algorithm to get, you know, that, that can determine whether or not a, 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 a homogeneous quadratic with rational coefficients is, is you, so you can tell whether or not a rational quadratic guy is integer superharmonic or not. Okay. So this, you know, there's some algorithm where you, know, you can reduce this to a sandpile computation on a torus. Okay. And you can use this to, right, to numerically approximate uh, this set. So we did this, I think, three years ago. And, and uh, we got the following answer. Okay, so we computed this set. And you know, plotted the surface in MATLAB. So the idea is gamma is everything below this surface in R3. So all of the, the integer superharmonic matrices are everything below uh, 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 this, uh, this graph. Hmm. What are the coordinates? Ah, so the coordinates are, oh no, it also doesn't erase. But maybe it doesn't matter <laughs> since you can't see it. OK, so the coordinates are, so I want to define, say, m of uh, a, b, c to be one half uh, a plus c, a minus c, b, b. Okay, so this, these are my coordinates, my three real coordinates. So the idea is c is giving you the trace of your matrix over the trace zero plane. Okay, and it turns out that, so this surface, it turns out gamma has this form. So this is the set of all uh, m, a, b, c, such that C is less than some function of A and B. Okay? And what I'm graphing is this function gamma. Oops. Okay, so what is this set? Um, you know, so when we first computed this, we were very excited. Okay, well, when we first computed this, we thought we had a software bug. <laughs> um, and then, and then we got very excited, and then we spent a long time. I don't know if you guys have ever used MATLAB, but you know you can you can play, play for a long time with the thing that displays surfaces and waste like three days of your life. And then one of your collaborators tells you, well, actually, maybe you should look at a heat map because now it looks much more orderly. So this is now instead of actually graphing this thing as a surface, I'm just using colors to represent the height on the plane. And then. You can stare at this for a while until one of your collaborators tells you, but wait a minute, uh, all of these cones are meeting in, uh, in the same plane, right? It seems like the bases all meet at the same height. 
And if you isolate that height, where all of the cones meet, then you see a classical fractal. Right, so this, this is an Apollonian circle packing. Okay. So, so what's an Apollonian circle packing? So, so the idea is, so for an Apollonian circle packing, right, so you start with uh, three pairwise tangent circles, right, and you, then you close under the addition of Sadi circles. Right, so if I have three pairwise tangent circles in the plane, then there are always exactly two Sadi circles, meaning circles which are tangent to all three of them. Right, so in this case, uh, uh, <coughs> this guy has two, so this triple has two Sadi circles here right, and here. Right. And if I add those in, well now there are uh, uh, six Sadi circles, right? There, there are three new uh, triples. Right? And for each of these uh, three new triples of pairwise tangent circles, there are two Sadi circles. Right? So there are, there are more at the next level, right? and so on. So if you start with any triple of pairwise tangent circles in the plane and close under the addition of Sadi circles, you get some packing like this. So again, these are circles. This is just the, just the computer. Okay, and so the the sand pile, PDE, right, the fractal that's sort of, uh, 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 the fractal structure is given by this, uh, uh, this band packing. You should explain what the numbers mean. Ah, ah, right, right. So, so, right, so one of the cool features of these Apollonian circle packings are that there are these integer Apollonian circle packings, which are circle packings where the curvatures of the circles are numbers. So here the curvature is one over the radius. <coughs> And so that's what these numbers are. These numbers are the curvatures of the circles. Wow. Okay, so I'm gonna I'll talk a little bit about this later, but so these circle packings have some, I mean, so, so there are, uh, there's some number theorists who are studying these circle packings, right? And are, so somehow there's a, in fact, there's a big open question. So there's a, a so right, so the, the natural question that they ask is, okay, uh, so given that there are these integer Apollonian circle packings, uh, uh, you might ask, well, what curvatures actually appear right, in these circle packings? So it turns out that for any given, uh, for, so for any given one of these integer uh, 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 Apollonian packings, um, there are some local obstructions to a, cur a curvature being in the packing. So you can just uh, do some easy computations and check that certain residues mod 24 are not allowed. Okay? And the conjecture is that, well, for any given integer superpacking beyond a, su a certain uh, 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 integer, uh, uh, these obstructions completely determine which curvatures are in or out. So there's this sort of local to global conjecture for these integer Apollonian superpackings. Did that get proved by Kontorovich? No, so they only have, uh, I thought that he and Borgan only have density one. And that he has proved the local to global conjecture in three dimensions. But I thought two was open. <coughs> Unless something may have changed in the last year that I didn't notice. I, uh, since my son was born, I have stopped reading the archive. <laughs> but I'm, yeah, do you know of anything more recent than, than this? So I saw him a year ago, and he hadn't proved this. Uh -huh, okay. So then, you, then, then your information is as recent as well. Okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I thought, right, the, I thought this current status is density one and true in three dimensions. Okay, so I forget what's on the next slide. Ah, right, okay. So, so here's the theorem. Okay, so, so what's the theorem? So, so the theorem is, well, if I look at, say, the maximal integer superharmonic uh, quadratics, so these are quadratics whose growth can't, who are, uh, quadratics which are integer superharmonic and whose growth can't be improved. So if I look at the maximal guys, well these are exactly right the peaks of the cones. So the theorem is, well the maximal guys are exactly the, uh, the peaks <coughs> of the cones over the circles in the Apollonian <coughs> right. So now I want to explain something about how, how this proof goes. So, so, how, so how do we prove this? So the idea 
is so, so now that we know we're that we're trying to show that the maximal guys are exactly the peaks of these cones, okay, well, we should investigate more closely these peaks, right? So we know, we know how to enumerate the circle packing, so now we can, now we can enumerate all of the peaks, right? and we can run our algorithm that determines whether or not you're in, uh, whether or not you're in gamma, right? So the peaks are all rational quadratics, right? They all have rational coefficients. So we can run an algorithm to determine whether or not uh, they're in gamma, and okay, it turns out they are, right? Because the theorem is correct. And more importantly, the algorithm actually gives us a witness. Right? The algorithm actually produces some u from z2 to z2, okay, which grows like the quadratic and has discrete Laplacian less than or equal to 3. And if you run this algorithm and you look at these things, and more, and more in, in particular if you look at the Laplacian of these things, what you see are the periodic patterns that showed up in the sand pile. Right? So like you can enumerate all of the peaks over the circles and say if you enumerate them in order of denominator, Right, over how complicated the, uh, the rational numbers are, then what you see are just ever increasing, the, uh, ever increasingly complicated patterns, and you can always find those patterns somewhere in the stable sand pile. Okay, so it turns out that, well, it's enough to essentially to enumerate all these patterns in order to prove the theorem. Okay, so if you, can, if you can construct one of these patterns for each peak, Okay, and it has the right properties, okay, then, uh, then actually this implies the theorem. Okay, so this is what we do. Okay, so this is, uh, 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 this is how we prove this theorem, is we just wrote down this really long induction proof. You know, so their induction hypothesis is very, very long, um, uh, 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 and that this induction proof constructs all of these patterns, and in particular, it generates one of these U's for every peak in the Apollonian circle packing. And it guarantees essentially that these peaks are maximal, that their growths can't be improved. And these two things together uh, 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 completely uh, 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 prove the theorem. Okay, so how does this go? So I'm gonna give you just some, some sense of the main idea of this induction proof. So how, how are we actually going to construct all of these patterns? Okay. It's the, so, so we knew somehow, you know, we, we ran our algorithm, we computed these things, we knew that the peaks corresponded to the patterns in the sand pile, and we were stuck for a long time trying to figure out how to actually construct them. Okay? And the big breakthrough was, well, to just actually read something about Apollonian circle packings. So there's this great series of papers by Ligarius, Malos, and Wilkes, and later by Graham, Ligarius, Malos, Wilkes, and Yan. So they, they've published a whole bunch of uh, papers on Apollonian circle packings and the number theory of Apollonian circle packings. And so for us, the most important thing was just to read the first paper in this series, okay, where they study uh, uh, the extended Descartes theorem. Okay, so there's this beautiful theorem, okay, which says that, well, if you have n plus one to, an n plus one tuple of spheres in Rn, then that n plus one tuple is pairwise tangent, okay, if and only if some, uh, 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 some quadratic form holds uh, on the, uh, the curvature coordinates. Right, so here, what do I mean by curvature coordinates? So I want to write a circle, say, with center at x and radius r uh, bigger than zero in the coordinates one over r comma x over r. Okay, so in curvature coordinates, it turns out that you can pick out n plus one pairwise tangent tuples of spheres by just checking some finite list of quadratic relations on the, uh, the curvature coordinates. So there's this really nice theorem, okay? And Okay, so as we all know um, uh, from the quadratic formula, so there's this nice, uh, the quadratic formula has this nice feature, or quadratic equations have this nice feature, which is if you can find one root, okay, uh, well, okay, finding one root in general requires that you actually compute a square root. Okay, but after you have that root, you can find the other one without doing anything difficult, right? You can just do uh, linear operations, okay? And the same thing happens here. Okay, so if I have a pairwise tangent triple of circles in the plane, okay, if I know one Saudi circle, then I can find the other one without doing any work. Right, I just do something linear. And there's a very simple formula. Okay, so if I have three pairwise tangent circles in the plane, C1, C2, and C3, and I have two Saudi circles, C0 and C4, well, then they satisfy this relation. Okay, so once I generated one Saudi circle, then I can find the other. And in fact, 
you can you can use this to prove that there are these inter integral abelian circle packings because the idea is sort of once you have a quadruple of pairwise tangent circles you can generate the whole pa the whole packing just by uh, jumping to the other Saudi circle of a triple so you can just iterate this linear rule okay to generate an entire circle packing once you have four circles that are pairwise tangent in, in it and because this linear thing has integer coefficients, if the first four circles have integer <coughs> curvature coordinates, all the later circles will have <coughs> integer curvature, uh, curvature coordinates. OK, so this is why there are these integer abelian circle packings, or this explains why there are. OK, more importantly, it actually tells us how to enumerate the patterns in the sand pile. OK, so here I've drawn five of the patterns in the sand pile, or well, five of the tiles that appear in the patterns in the sand pile. And, and I've chosen them such that, well, you know, C1, C2, and C3 are a pairwise tangent triple, and that C4 and C0 are the two Saudi circles, correspond to the two Saudi circles. Okay. Right, so I have this picture, you know, it's basically like, uh, so I have, you know, C1, uh, I'm not going to do this right. Okay, so I have C1. Let's say I have, uh, how can I do this without, uh, I forget how to draw this picture. Oh. Let's just make one of these guys some huge circle. And then I'm going to have uh, this guy and uh, this guy, this guy. So the idea is I have C1, say C2 and C3. This is C4, and C0 is in here. Okay. So I have three pairwise tangent circles in the plane, right? and then I'm looking at their two Saudi circles. I'm looking at the patterns that are on the peaks above these guys. OK, so it turns out that this guy is twice the sum of these three minus this guy. Right, so in, in what sense? Well, in the sense of just gluing them together. Right, so it turns out that if I look at this later guy, let's say this guy appears twice. He's here and here. Right? This guy appears twice, here and here. This guy also appears twice, here and here. And then we're subtracting this one because the two copies of these overlap exactly on the copy of one of these guys. Okay, so this, this observation that we just sort of made empirically to, is, is basically the key to the whole induction proof. So once you make this observation, well, then, then you spend a few months mired in technical details trying to figure out how to actually you know, get the darn uh, induction hypotheses right. Okay. Um, so but, but this is the main idea of the proof, is just making this observation and then just you know, pushing through the technical details. OK, so, so this is the story for the square lattice. And what's nice about having this theorem is so it turns out that once you have this theorem and you know, you know the explicit structure of the PDE, well, then actually you can construct solutions. OK, so while I can't explain the single source fractal or even the fractal on the square, if I change the domain to something a little bit nicer, okay, it turns out that I can completely explain the fractal that appears. So if I take this kind of uh, jelly bean shaped domain, right, if I take a grid approximation of that uh, domain, and I solve the same sand pile problem that I did for the square, right, so if I replace the square, right, if I replace the square by some uh, grid approximation of this jelly bean shaped domain, and I solve the same problem, well, then I get this sand pile. On the other hand, I can, I can explicitly solve the, uh, the PDE. Okay. And somehow, so I have this problem of color schemes, which is when you explicitly solve the PDE, there's a natural color scheme to use. And then, explicit, and, then, and, then, and then, of course, the sand pile has this other color scheme. But it's kind of hard to see what's happening. Right? It gets very, because you know, the shading is funny. So instead, I have this intermediate image where I've taken the sand pile, which is huge. So this is like 10,000 by 10,000. And I average over, I think it's 100 by 100 squares. So average over 100 by 100 squares, and I get this guy. And then this guy I can put in the same color scheme as that. So right, this, this discrete guy really is converging to this you know, explicit solution. 
okay, which is sort of nice computational confirmation of our theorem. Okay. <coughs> so you know we can prove that this is the limit. So it better be the case that, that this happens. Okay, so so this is the this is essentially all we know about the square lattice right now. And this was maybe the state of the art as of a year ago, I think. So maybe all of you have already heard all this before in Lionel's talk. Okay. Okay, but what about other graphs? Okay, so it turns out that well, the scaling limit proof works on any periodic Euclidean graph. Okay, so in particular, it works on the triangular lattice and the hexagonal lattice. So the scaling limit proof works, and the algorithm for estimating uh, the, ga the corresponding gamma sets also works. Okay, so you can run that algorithm and estimate gamma. Oh wait, and you can also run the uh, compute the single source sand pile, and, the, and they have uh, uh, nice uh, fractal shapes. Okay, and then you can compute these uh, uh, these uh, gamma sets. Okay, and you get uh, other images. Okay. So these are the sets of integer superharmonic quadratics for the triangular lattice and for the hexagonal lattice. Right, or well, this is the surface right bounding that set. Okay, so we also had these pictures. Uh, you know, maybe a, a, a year or two ago. And we were staring at them for a very long time trying to figure out you know, what they were. So some, the, the, the square lattice picture was somehow much uh, more recognizable to us. Um, but then a few months ago, we went back to these pictures um, and we realized that uh, 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 we know exactly what they are. That sort of finally having read enough back of the background literature, we can just recognize exactly what these surfaces are. OK, so having told you that these are immediately recognizable, can you tell me what, uh, what this thing is? So this also looks is like, like the, looks a lot like the integers, or perhaps the, <coughs> the Ford fundamental domain for the, the group Q of uh, uh, a join uh, Q root of 1. Yeah. It looks yeah. a lot like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it is. This is uh, this is very much uh, uh, related to the these are the uh, the Eisenstein integers, right? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So this, right? Uh, yeah. So actually, maybe you can tell me uh, uh, whether or not what you said actually is the is is exactly what I'm about to say. Okay. So this is just like the square lattice in that the cones appear to all be meeting at a common level set. And it turns out that this is just another circle packing. Okay, in fact, it's another, it's an integer uh, circle packing. Okay, but what circle packing is it? Oh, those numbers are Fibonacci numbers. <coughs> but they're not all Fibonacci <laughs> numbers. Wait, but they're not all Fibonacci numbers? Well, no? 25 don't appear. Like two and five don't appear. Right, oh, I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. right, okay. So the way you generate the circle packing, so, so, so the thing you had to learn in order to recognize this picture is the following. So there's another way to generate the band packing. Okay, so there's this way to generate the band packing where I start with three circles and I start adding Saudi circles and I continue. Okay, it turns out there's a better way to generate the circle packing if you know something about hyperbolic groups. Okay, which is you start with four pairwise tangent circles in the plane. Okay, and then you draw the four circles that are orthogonal to any three of them. And then what you do is you close under inversion in these circles. Okay, so for example, uh, so if I invert in, in a single step, I get four new circles, right? So, like, so this circle here, right? So if I invert in this guy, that leaves, well, let's, let's go back. If I invert in this guy, that leaves the three circles that it's orthogonal to fixed. So that's going to fix this guy and this guy and this line. But then this line here that it's, uh, uh, that's outside of it is going to get mapped to a circle in here. Okay. So each one of these is just the image of the circle right, that's not orthogonal to the guy we're inverting in. Okay. And if you just continue in this way, you get the whole circle back. If you just close under inversion, you get the whole circle back. 
Okay, so it turns out that we can get the packing we were just looking at in the same sort of way. So we start with these three circles in the plane. Okay, we're gonna draw four circles that are orthogonal to some subset of them. Right, so there's this guy that's orthogonal to all three of them, and then the lines that are orthogonal to any two of them. And then we close under inversion. And that generates this, the other scaling one. Okay, so is this what you were talking about? It's close. <laughs> it's, it's close. close. It's, a, it's saying that what you're drawing is the limit set of the Schottky group uh, gotten by, well, the Schottky group itself would be a subgroup of index two in the group of uh, automorphisms of hyperbolic space generated by the inversions. By those four inversions. Are, by those four inversions. Right. So there's a certain subgroup of SL2C, right. which would be quite easy to, uh, to write ge down generators for explicitly. That's right. And which is probably a subgroup of the group SL2 of the ring of integers in the, uh, in the field uh, generated by the cube roots of one. It's okay. probably a subgroup of finite no, indexes. That's there. right. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, that's and absolutely right. This is the limit set of that uh, limit set of that group. Right. Or well, this is part of the limit set of this. It's group. part of the well, yeah. Because there are points in the in the closure yeah. of these circles yeah. that are not one of the circles. No, well, the the <coughs> group is it's a finite index was probably wrong. It's a fi it's a subgroup of that group, right, but not a finite index. So that the limit set uh, has. It, it, that group itself has the whole plane as the limit set. But the, this one is a sub subgroup of that. Okay. 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 Well, so maybe I, I will come and bother you about this. Uh, okay, so, so this is the hexagonal lattice. Okay, so, so what about the triangular one? So this one was a little bit trickier. Um, so part of the problem is okay, so the color scheme, it's going to be a little hard to look at this, but so these cones that are, the well, three big cones somehow are easy to see. And there's this kind of curvilinear triangular region where these, there are these other cones. Okay? But this is not like the square or the hexagonal lattice where the cones all be, appear to be meeting at the same common level set. Okay, so something else is going on. So let me show you a picture of just this isolated inner region. So if I look at just this inner region, okay, I get this sort of packing of cones and they're on some surface. So to solve this one, well, okay, so we, we sort of improved our algorithm to, uh, so you can improve it so that it actually enumerates rational points on the boundary of gamma. Okay, so somehow we can enumerate all the rational points on the boundary of gamma. So if you do that, if you enumerate all the points on the boundary of gamma, then you can find this surface, right? You, or at least you can find some of the points on the surface. You can ask yourself, what kind of surface is it? Okay, it turns out that it's a hyperbola. So it's a hyperbola. And then, if you dig a little further, you realize that, well, the intersection of these cones with the hyperbola okay, are actually circles uh, uh, in the standard model of hyperbolic space on that hyperbola. So in fact, what this packing is, if you just look at the, where the cones intersect the surface, it's just an Appalachian circle packing of hyperbolic space. Okay, so I can draw it in the Poincaré disk like, like this. Okay, so the triangular lattice has a scaling limit which is you know, given by an Apollonian circle packing, but of hyperbolic space, not of Euclidean space. Or a hyperbolic plane rather than Euclidean. Okay, so you could ask, well, what about even more general graphs? So there are lots of uh, uh, periodic uh, uh, planar Euclidean graphs, in infinitely many even. Um, and so we have actually a program, I think it's still running on, on a server right now, which is just basically dovetailing all, over all possible um, uh, uh, periodic Euclidean graphs in the plane and computing the gamma sets for each of them. So that uh, we, can, uh, we can get some data to, to see what sort of happens in general. And so for these six graphs, so these are six of the sort of simpler ones, uh, we have these approximate pictures of what the gamma sets look like, and, and they look like this for these six graphs. <coughs> so there are all sorts of wild, uh, uh, wild gamma sets out there. 
And the thing we're trying to do now is to figure out what's going on in general. So we'd like to understand uh, you know, if these just all fall into some family of surfaces. OK, so um, that's all. I think this is the end of my talk. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Charles, for this uh, very interesting and colorful talk. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any questions or remarks? <coughs> Connections back to number theory? Connections back to number theory. Well, we're still <coughs> dreaming that we're going to be able to use the sand pile to prove the local to global conjecture. Right, so we'd really, you know, there's this conjecture that, you know, the, there's some list of residues mod 24 uh, such that every every curvature above some threshold is a curvature in the band packing if and only if it is one of these residues mod 24. Uh, and so this has been proved up to density uh, one by uh, 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 Kontorovich and, and Borgan. And, uh, uh, and you know, we would like to, you know, so we have some we're still hoping that we're going to be able to resolve this using the sand pile, but you know, this is a a wild dream. Right? There's no, we have no, uh, uh, we have no strong reason to believe that we have an advantage over these uh, very skilled number theorists. So. What, what what would that mean in this model? Would be to not have those mods that before. How do you right, so I mean, so we can we can change the question of whether or not a curvature is in the uh, uh, the circle packing to a question about the sand pile, right? So you can ask essentially, is there a, essentially you can ask, well, is there a configuration on some torus that has some uh, 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 that has some density and is stable? Um, and so maybe you know we can hope that maybe that question is is more tractable. Than the question of whether or not, you know, uh, some uh, uh, some integer is in the orbit of uh, of some complicated subgroup of uh, uh, SL four Z. So. Any other questions? Remarks? Alex, other applications? Any other applications in this field? Other, well, okay. So, uh, so it depends on what you call an application. Um, so, uh, it is another natural example of a degenerate elliptic PDE, um, and and in that sense is sort of useful in thinking about uh, certain regularity questions for elliptic PDE. So there's some. There are some pure math applications that I have in mind. Um, so I am also interested in regularity for you know, elliptic equations. And uh, you know, this thing is degenerate elliptic and has these you know, piecewise quadratic solutions. So it's, it's this kind of interesting example. And um, yeah, so there, there are some applications there. Um, and yeah, so I don't know about the actual statistical physics side of things. Right? So this sand pile is supposed to be a model of self-organized criticality. Right. Lionel is, I know, trying to actually resurrect this as a physical theory, um, and uh, but but actually, I don't know if this is really going to this particular side of the story is going to be useful in doing that. Okay. Any other questions, remarks? Okay. Let's thank Charlie.